Hello and welcome to the fourth installment of the Nausicast, where we go through every Ghibli film in chronological order with discussions and analysis that is worthy of them. And this time, for the first time, we'll cover a film by a director other than Miyazaki, which immediately reflected itself in the quality and quantity of available sources to read up on the film. Today, we are talking about Grave of the Fireflies, directed by Isao Takahata. With me today are a lot of returning hosts, but also a new voice, the Sandra. Introduce yourself. Hello, my name is The Thunder. Um, I'm, in the, I'm, a, I'm a music major in college, but I don't know how to talk about music, so I'm not going to do that. Amazing. Also with us again are uh, Platon Skull. Hello, I, uh, I study film and media studies uh, at a university level, and I am here to talk about a film where we watch two kids die slowly. It's going to be fun. Oof. And Hipster Kazulu. It's me again. Don't try to hold back your disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> and we also have Miki. Hi, it's uh, me, Miki. And of course, me, as always, Nyad. No need for introductions there. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, we have a film here, not by Miyazaki, but by Isao Takahara, as I mentioned before. So, who is this guy? Um, unfortunately, not as well known in the West as Miyazaki today, but I would say in Japan, he's about as big a deal as Miyazaki, right? Yeah, pretty much. He was like a like a, more of a household name known for his movies before Miyazaki, and is of course known for like training Miyazaki and like bring, being his mentor. He passed away relatively recently too. Uh, a few years ago. It's uh, rest in peace. What a what a cheerful note to start on. Really matches the movie. <laughs> oh, it's uh, it's only gonna go down from here. Yeah, down uh, all, much like all the downhill. much like the health of say Tanzetsuko, but we'll get to that. Oh yeah, so the relationship between Takahata and Miyazaki has always been a, a relatively close working relationship. I want to say because Takahata's first directing uh, de debut was like Horus Prince of the Sun, uh, the Great Adventure of Horus Prince of the Sun, a movie from the from sixty eight. And uh, Miyazaki already worked on it with him, and uh, Takahara, being a little bit older, uh, recognized the talents of Miyazaki quite early on. They kept working together throughout the 70s until the early 80s. Like, they worked on Panda Copanda together, they worked on Lupin the Third together, they worked on um, all kinds of things together. Um, and finally, when Nausicaa turned out to be uh, 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 at least somewhat of a success, and Miyazaki was like, Takahara, look, it's working. Please, please found a studio with me. Then they got together and actually founded Studio Ghibli. So uh, Isao Takahara is a, is a co-founder as well. So Grave of the Fireflies is... Um, actually, I said, I said a similar thing last time, that Totoro was like the film that got, its, uh, got, got Ghibli a lot of international fame, but it's actually wrong because Grave of the Fireflies is much more... Uh, has much earlier gotten international track, interna international discussion, and has much earlier established the name of Studio Ghibli internationally, which is uh, which is quite interesting for me to read because I didn't actually know that before before um, I stumbled across that little fact. Yeah, Takahata was a much bigger name even in Japan at that point. So like, um, it was like the the the, the, the um, double feature of this movie and My Neighbor Totoro was meant to like basically prop up a more experimental film of Totoro with a film that was more likely to succeed which is funny to think about now exactly we, uh, we mentioned that uh last uh episode of this podcast go listen to it it's uh my neighbor totoro we talked but about also, that also this uh this movie is an adaptation of the nosaka akayuki short story of the same name which i believe he's a somewhat known writer in japan so it would have like already been a a popular idea to make a film of his like literary work, adaptation yeah, there there was a lot of discussion about this um, uh, with Nosaka himself about how to adapt this film, and it, he has re rejected multiple p uh, studios who approached him with the proposition of making it into a live action film. But when he was like shown the storyboards of the animated film, he immediately was on board with it and said, "This is it. We are going with this." So I thought this was kind of interesting. Uh, I, I think I don't I don't think this w uh, would have been as effective a film uh in in live action uh and but 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 they still like w went to some extra effort to uh to add to the authenticity uh, of the film specifically uh they got a really young voice actress for the role of yeah. Setsuko uh b because Takahata believed uh it would otherwise like be inauthentic and or distracting 
so so even though they had to uh, uh, go against uh, co- conventions in uh, Japanese animation and uh, animate after recording because you know uh, a oh, yeah. really young it's actress is much uh, is much more unpredictable and unable to sync after the fact. Uh, but 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 they so they went through the extra trouble for that. And it's also interesting because uh, uh, Roger Ebert talked about this, that Grave of the Fireflies not only requires, as he said, a rethinking of animation and that in what capacities it can be utilized for very serious work, but also he, he discussed the idea that uh, child actors couldn't have conveyed like the, the way uh, you were supposed to feel in, in Grave of the Fireflies. He says that when you finally see the images of Setsuko starving and dying, um, because she's animated, she's less of like literally that child and more of an abstract idea of a, chi- of a child starving. That um, instead of watching a young actress play this role, which would distract us, he says, we watch uh, the idea of a girl die there. It is a purer statement about the horror of war, as he said it. This was quite interesting as to why uh, animation is such a good choice in, in this movie, I think. I also think the animation works pretty well because you can, of course, like show her to be much more like emaciated and like terrible looking than you could with any kind of like special effects. And I think in general, it gives the whole um, setting of the film far more credence because you'd have to always have, you know, constructed sets and like a kind of a layer of fiction and fakeness over the live action actors. But in an animated film, it's like the war is real. Everything that you're seeing is part of the same like cohesive world that's like is burning down and people are dying in so i think in a weird way the animation almost makes it more real than a than real people doing it if that makes any sense um first of all i, th- I think you're underestimating the power of like, like, like what kind of special effects work uh, what kind of things they can accomplish it's true of course that like oftentimes uh in at least in lesser war films it, it feels like you're walking around in really well laid out rubble instead of like the actual like rubble of uh, a burnt down building for example but uh, it, it it definitely can be done i th- i think what's what what happens here with the animation is what always happens with animation is um it has to like by necessity um simplify like like it it ha- has to like go down to, to like the core uh, visual elements that make up these characters and these actions and these movements yeah, um, abstraction and, and, and in a sense. Exactly, yeah. abstraction. That's that, that's uh, a good term for it, um, yeah. which makes the uh, the transformation of these characters um, much more like like vivid and clear, uh, and, uh, and and I, I and also there's that element of it being since it's abstracted to that uh, level of animation, it becomes it feels more universal. It feels like Setsuko could actually stand in for any young girl instead of being all about like a performance. And Aki Yuki Nosaka has also mentioned that he thought that live action, in his opinion, wouldn't be able to capture the 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 scorched earth and the desolation that was the backdrop of this story because his experience with these uh images with these uh, fire bombings and so on have been semi-autobiographical and ent- actually this entire short story it's based on is semi-autobiographical for him having been in a fire bombing himself having been a big brother protecting his little sister who starved similarly as in the film and you know takahara also have him as a as a child in fourth, fourth grade he was at the time experienced fire bombings in a different city has of course also a direct um, vision of it that he then put into film. So I thought it was sort of was really interesting how to have these real insiders, real experience perspectives taking over the idea of trying to abstract it and, and put it into art as closely resembling the real emotional impact of it as possible. I definitely like like this. Uh, it's uh, it's it, it's kind of a well known thing that. Uh, I, I think someone once said about uh, like World War One. It was a it was terrible if you liked being alive, but if you liked harrowing literature about the horrors of war, then it was like a golden age. And I think that's that, that's. I mean, you you couldn't have this um, a movie this harrowing and authentic without like having like at least a degree of 
a first person experience uh somewhere along the way of its uh, its creation and i think it it like e- even if you don't know it already it's it's already like uh a really yeah again harrowing but like knowing that the uh the writer of the original story and that the director of the film have experienced something even remotely close to this just makes it all the more uh all the more tragic to uh, to watch and it is <laughs> quite tragic to watch uh, i can tell you that much it's a rough experience this we'll, is we'll, we'll get to that uh, yeah, in a bit true so this uh this film is uh based on a semi autobiographical literary work about uh uh, World War II. Uh, f- it was made by a famous director at the time. Like it, it, it obviously like had all these um, markings of like an important uh, s- uh, work of cinema, uh, and it was like released alongside Totoro, which was this quaint little uh, hour and a half film about uh, this fluffy little monster. I, I can you can actually you can kind of understand why at the time. It seemed to be like the the big draw uh, at the at the box office, uh, at least uh, before uh, Totoro like exploded in popularity. Yeah, th- I mean that's uh, a listen to the Totoro cast for more information on that. But this is of course because of Totoro's experimental structure of having almost no narrative. Meanwhile, Grave of the Fireflies has a very straightforward narrative. You could almost say it's one of the most direct <laughs> storylines I've, I've ever encountered you know i had to, at, uh, i think that that's the in, that's so the most interesting thing about grave of the fireflies in, in my opinion is like is how straightforward it is uh, while still being effective uh it like we're, we're not going to be talking uh, like about a bunch of uh like complex uh structures or uh th- the thematic elements it's, it's really like like the film is straightforward we know from the very beginning of the film what it's going to be about because at the very start of the film we see Sata die and we see the his spirit his ghost uh, or whatever just standing there and declaring that uh, on this date i think it's september 21st uh, 1945 he died and now we we get to see how he and his little sister died, and then we we follow after their uh, house burns down. We follow them to the aunt's house. We follow them to this um, makeshift home uh, out in the woods in an abandoned bomb shelter, and we watch them die. And that's the movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so rough. Yeah, I, that's not going to be as many jokes this time around. Uh, I, I, I can, you can already tell that. But um, the most interesting thing is how uninteresting it seems, like on a, uh, on the surface. But of course, we, as we'll get to, there's a lot of complexity hiding uh, just underneath uh, that surface, um, and the least of which is uh, the the making of the film, because any animation film requires a lot of work and a lot of consideration. Yeah, here's a fun thing. They got Hideaki Anno to blow shit up. Yeah, that's actually a thing. <laughs> in this, in this. Yeah, they of course had him on staff ready. <laughs> to draw explosions and uh, attacks by bombers, by, by fireball uh, airplanes. Yeah, of course, it was of course Anno doing the plane cuts if Miyazaki wasn't on hand to do them. Yeah. <laughs> But, but that's of course very interesting also under the picture. I, I, while we're talking about the, the plane cuts and the bombings, I thought it was really interesting how you never really picture how such a firebomb, incendiary bomb may look. It was actually just this tin shell dropping and burning and sizzling a little and spreading some fluid everywhere. When Sata was standing in the streets as the little bombs were falling, he was just looking at them like, huh? And they were dropping, and it didn't seem like much of an impact at the time until everything started burning around him. It was a really interesting uh, um, way to depict this, or rather, a very, I won't even say realistic, because that's probably how it is. Uh, yeah, I believe it was pretty realistic because Takahata was saying that, you know, like that he saw fire bombings firsthand, and yeah, a lot of it was just like these canisters that fall, and then just suddenly everything's on fire. And I think it really. Um, 
keys into a lot of what the going on in the film because it's not like a bombastic bombing or it even makes any reference to the you know uh, the nuclear bombing of Japan it's more about uh these people kind of slowly suffering so we don't even see people die in a dramatic way or in a way that's like uh good for film in that sense it's just like everything just burns down and totaled and everyone just has to move on and slowly starve so it's it does not in any way relish all the uh the fight of war that you get from other films that want to comment on being anti-war while still giving you kind of excitement and fun to see yeah and we'll definitely get into uh that that element of it and um but I th- I, th- I think uh th- this point about it being such uh, so like in a way undramatic but uh, i'm not sure that's the right word because of course it's it's a dramatic moment in the film but but unceremonious let's let's call it yeah um, i want to say it doesn't milk it for like melodrama yeah, or exactly. trying to get cheap exactly. tears i think roger ebert also said something about this way he talked about like disney films if they try to tackle like serious mature themes he said evoke tears none of them try the hand at evoking serious grief which is what grave of the fireflies did Exactly, and I think in the West, especially when we imagine, like, like w- when we talk about the civilian casualties in Japan during World War II, instantly everyone thinks, "Oh, right, Hiroshima and Nagasaki." We we think about the atomic bombings, um, but like the the truth of it is that the fire bombings started uh, like long before uh, like the, the the atomic bombs were, were even like a, an option, and they uh, and many 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 civilians died from those fire bombings i think more than uh, died from uh, both uh, atomic bombs uh, put together and th- and so uh, i think a part of the reason is that we, we we like to imagine the atomic bombs as unimaginable a, a last option like like unthinkably cruel when in reality like like the main difference between that and the fire bombings is how quickly they they kill that many people. Not the fact that so many civilians died. I think this is interesting too, because I think he almost goes out of his way to avoid mentions of these of these like bigger like events. Events of like, you know, like there's no talk of the Emperor. There's no there's very little talk of the war in a like like a military capacity. There's no talk of the bombs. I think I think that's it's really interesting because I think the film in a, in a way goes out of its way to make sure what's the focus of the film is not these big world changing events, but rather almost like a slow decline in a way that like never ends even to the very end of the movie where it's the same it's, it's the same perspective like there's no there's 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 no atomic bomb to say okay now the now the war is really over there's no oh now na- now we're in a new space where like we can we can you know can recuperate our losses and deal with it it's just, there's, there's there's nothing like that it just slowly like spirals into the end yeah i noticed that as well it almost felt like a uh, apocalyptic in a sense in the way that everything is just slowly kind of ending like mad max one and everyone's just kind of dealing with it and just going around and as we see towards the end of the film uh Sheeta didn't even know the war was over until someone like told him so things didn't even drastically change so so much between um like the war being on and the war ending because everyone's still starving everyone's still homeless so it's just this perpetual, like, downward spiral. The fact that he dies after the war is over, I think, is really significant in that regard. Yeah. And, and I also think that the, the whole avoiding the atomic bomb, it's, uh, it's also, like, an important element of the film is, like, the idea of, like, the um, importance of these characters. Uh, because it, if the atomic bombs were, like, a focal point, then it would be about like a story revolving around this moment that changed the world that changed the course of world history but it's not it's about one of the many 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 uh civilians the many children that died as as a result of this what what in in the context of the times was like a normal attack like it, it was a regular occurrence uh, these kinds of fire bombings and these kinds yeah, of as results. we see by the repeated sirens by the by like everyone knows what to do already they know retreat to the air raid shelters and they know where to go and uh and at one point like the aunt where they stay mentioned at one point these nightly air raids or that might might have been an exaggeration on her part because she seemed pretty upset in that moment but it is very very frequent very often constant routine and i thought and that that whole sense of um hopeless everyday suffering is like like goes through the uh, whole movie and i think that's 
part of the reason why uh, this movie is just so unrelentingly depressing. And I think it's also very interesting how this experience is underlined by a technical aspect which deviates it from, from a lot of anime at the time because to my knowledge, uh, Grave of the Fireflies is the first anime that like ditched as much as possible the, the black outlines that were characteristic of the art and went instead with brown outlines. Very soft, very subdued. Like Some things are still with black outlines, like facial features, for example, have quite often uh, black outlines, but a lot of stuff has been replaced by brown outlines, which gave it a more like dire, more soft, more washed out, more uh, earthy look, I want to say. This really fits in well with the overall like sense of the film, the tone of the film, yeah, which like is, it, of course, uh, definitely. And like it's aesthetically, like they feel more like grimy and uh, and dirty, especially like later on in the film. And I th uh, m maybe those outlines are part of it, but uh, but I'm not I'm not sure. Like I'm not an animation expert. I also think it's interesting to compare that. Think about like that with the whole like facial expressions of this movie. It's very different than most animes, and specifically very different than um, Miyazaki's uh, movies, um, facial animations. Like you have this really, ca there's a lot of care put into every like little wrinkle in people's faces and this whole like, when people like smile, there's like this like great effort put into it. Oh, about Takahata facial expressions. I really like how he really also, like only yesterday, there's this, the, the main woman has this very notorious grin with like the 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 wide grin with like the, the i dimples. don't even know what the part of the face is called but you have it here the too dimples, and sata right. is like really happy really happy you see his face like the dimple and 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 setsuko when she's crying her whole face is crumpling up like a child would it, it's odd because you don't usually get these kinds of facial animations yeah, it's a tad more realistic. Well, not not realistic, but in the way that there's still like exaggerated anime characters. But uh, yeah, it's more of attention to more different details. I think going so for real, it, uh, go, going for a sense of realism rather than being realistic. Exactly, yeah, like an aesthetic. Yeah. Uh, it's an aesthetic choice that separates it from a lot of like more uh, more ad adventurous. Uh, uh, family friendly uh, animation that like yeah the like the like the cheeks in only yesterday it's something other animators wouldn't really focus on or like uh, animate more just to like give it that different feel yeah i, th I think for a practical uh, like a, it's a practical effect it really does an amazing job of making it so you can make characters smile but at the same time showing them carry the weight of their like entire existence on their backs while they do so and i really like that also showing that and it's a very interesting thing because many people look goofy when they smile and this is highlighted in Takahata's films yeah. very uh, directly. And I think he, he it's, loves it's the cool. goofiness. Yeah. yeah. But like, un unfortunately, we, we don't really get to be that happy along with the characters. Oh, yeah. Yeah, not a lot of smiling goes on in this movie. Uh, well, some, like, like some, especially I, from the I audience. Think a lot. Yeah, I was like, but from, yeah, from there, from there, they're, 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 they're pretty quote unquote happy, quote unquote, quote, um, <laughs> in the movie. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, the happiness constantly built on evading the reality and the escapism and so on. But yeah, they are yeah. smiling, they are playing. Of course, it's mm -hmm. a child, so of course she has this childlike joy. And the very uh, sad death. So let's talk about how fucking brutally devastating and emotionally draining th this movie is. Yeah, it's, it's famously or maybe infamously depressing. Uh, like, it's, it's, it's among, like, the first films people think about when they talk about like s movies that emotionally devastate them, and that's a really good reason for that. Uh, I, I, I myself, I, um, I don't, uh, I watched it for the first time like a year ago, maybe more, um, and I didn't, I elected not to rewatch it for this cast, which I do for all the others because, like, I, I, I know I've seen. The movie and I, I, I it, it it takes a lot um, to 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 watch it to to actually like engage with it and people should be prepared for that. I was dreading the rewatching of the film and I postponed it as much as possible. Actually, like I did all my reading on all my. Usually, I watch the film once of, as preparation for the podcast. I watch the film once, um, then read all the uh, material I need to read, and then I rewatch the film, taking notes again to pick up on things I previously didn't pick up on. This time, I did all the reading, and then two hours before the podcast, I watched the film and was like, "Oh fuck!" 
And like immediately within like the openings, 20 minutes of, or rather 15 minutes, the scene, the depiction of him dying at the train station and the, the tin can being chucked out, I immediately started being overwhelmed by like the sheer blunt force of the film's emotional devastation. And like after the film, when the credits were playing, I was like, I, I, I would just want to collapse on my desk right now and be lying there for a moment because, oof. Well, see, now I feel like a monster because I didn't have such a strong reaction. Yeah, that no, makes that, you a monster. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but you, you are Cthulhu, that we've established yeah. that. Honestly, Don't, to be honest, I do find the, um, to me, um, maybe not like the most emotionally devastating thing, but certainly the most like, like randomly horrific and awful part of the whole movie is uh, towards the beginning where we see the mother, where he's just like, you see the mother, she goes off to the shelter, and then like five minutes later, he goes to the hospital and he's like, where's my mum? And then he just goes in and just sees this, like, corpse, like, with all the skin burnt off, just, like, lying there, barely breathing, covered in maggots. And he's like, oh, that's your mother. And then, like, he, he and it just, like, cuts away again. Just this incredibly devastating, like, horrific things that happened to his mother, and it just gives it, like, no time to process or anything. It's just something that happened, and he now has to deal with. And we learned that, like, she died that same day as they took her away. I, and this topic, what's also very rough, the moment that like devastates me the most, like the things that hit the hardest are the moments when I realize that he was just keeping it all in, that he was like yeah. eating up the despair and so on that he was feeling. Like when he, when the doctor was talking about his mother, he was like shocked and didn't really react. When, when they were talking about, yeah, your mother died, we need to, we need to get rid of her body now. He was just standing there coldly like, oh, oh, okay. And in front of Setsuko, he always needed to be strong and smile and pretend that mother is still alive and d d distract her because she's weaker. She's more fragile. And he didn't want her to know it. And th the roughest moment for me was, I think, when she told him that she knows. Yeah. And he was just uh, breaking down because yeah. in this moment, his entire illusion that he was keeping up with being the strong protector shattered and he was just crying. Yeah, th yeah, those those moments are often like like it's often much sadder watching people try not to cry than it is to like watch people cry. For me, I actually found the saddest parts of the movie with, when I when I rewatched it yesterday. The, the parts of the movie that made me cry were the parts that um were them being happy, were them eating fruit drops. Those those parts of the movie I think I, were, are the saddest on rewatch because like you like understand how like futile and like ridiculous they are really. Uh, so what about you, Miki? You've been awfully quiet this time. So how did the movie uh, affect you? Um, I, I haven't seen it before, so I I sort of only knew about the movie, and I knew uh, like people talk about how sad it is. But um, what was surprising to me was that it was more just oppressive in general. It was just um, highly like like it's more. The, the the parts that where I felt most impacted was when they finally when they make the decision to move out from society. I think that's really the moment where like everything's sealed for them. Everything is uh, set in stone, and from that point, it's it's the point of no return. Um, that that feeling of hopelessness. Yeah, and it's rough yeah. because you yeah. see them departing, and you really you know <laughs> this isn't yeah. gonna go well. But like in a way, you 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 had that feeling from the very start. But but we'll we'll get yeah. to that later. I love I love how like when they're departing from the house to go live alone, they present it as this like big hopeful. Oh, we're going to create a new world for ourselves. But you like in your heart know that this is this is this is um you, they're 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 abandoning their lives. They're they're going to almost as as I will talk about this later. But um but um um there's a some um, what's your name. Gold, um, what's, I'm blanking her Goldberg. name right now. Goldberg. Goldberg. She talks about how what they're doing is a kind of double suicide, but we can talk about that later. Mm -hmm. Oh, actually, Definitely. not just Goldberg, um, but <laughs> we'll get to this. Yeah, 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 we keep, we keep repeating Get that. to a lot of it because, but like, actually, yeah. the original author said in the interview before Graves of Firefest was released that I mentioned earlier, the original author said, oh, yes, this is yeah. a double suicide story. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so we'll, yeah. we'll be able to talk about that. Definitely. Well, not, not on purpose, but like, it's, uh, it has yes, and I believe uh, Takahata also said that this point of them deciding to like remove themselves from society was like their biggest mistake, and like what he hopes uh, like children watching the film will learn from Shita as his major mistake of thinking he can 
kind of do everything by himself and like can live by his own pride as opposed to kind of like trying to live within society and help the people he de- that depend on him. I think that brings us to one of the, like the core things about uh, the movie. Uh, now, now that we've gone out of the way and <laughs> dealt with like how depressing it is, um, the the thing is like what's what is to blame for these kids' deaths? Because uh, because I, I I would definitely describe this as an anti-war movie and and like ab- absolutely one of the best anti-war movies ever, at least that I've ever seen. But there, there is some discussion to be had there. This is interesting enough where Takahata himself disagrees with you. And, 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 and <laughs> well, after what I first watched the movie, so yeah, after <laughs> well, I first watched the movie, with and you I, after he makes the movie, during the movie, he gave it during the making of the movie, he did give an interview where he said it's not exclusively an anti-war film. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so this, but this is still also uh, one of the most puzzling things that gave me like stuff to think about the film. When I watched it the first time and was devastated and, and all the stuff, and then I went on to Google just to look up some interviews and some reviews and some blogs on it. And it quoted Takahata saying that he thought this isn't really an anti-war movie. What he said is that um, he doesn't consider it an anti-war movie because he wanted to say something else, wanted to convey something else, but also because this movie will not prevent future wars. This was his phrasing. He says, <laughs> I don't consider this an anti-war movie because it will not prevent wars. Well, very restrictive definition there, Mr. Takahata, but okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'd, like see, yeah. I'd like to see what real anti-war films there are. Uh, how, yeah, how do they actually prevent wars? wars from happening? Yeah, that, that, that would be incredible. Like, th- there would be like this one movie that just like stopped people from declaring war on each other. That would be amazing, but I don't think that's ever happening. It's like the opposite of The Ring, the video that stops people from dying. <laughs> well, I, I, I think what he, I, I think in a way, there's this, this, when I, when I, when, when I think one says this is not an anti war movie, I think it means it's not really trying to deal with war as a concept. There's more, I feel like the movie is more. Trying to deal with the idea of these, um, these prescribed roles that are like exasperated by war. Yeah, I agree to that a lot because I think the, um, the war in the film is far more of a, a setting than it is like the events because we never really learn that much about like what's happening out in the Pacific and, uh, all the tactical nature of it or even what time it is. And like we were saying, how he only finds out the war's ended like just by someone saying it to him later on and really it's more of a about the society around the war and but how see, like, the, thing the is, war has like, done this to them the point you're making there like are all are like part of the reason why i believe this to be such a potent anti-war film but but it's uh it, it, it's a pretty like it's pretty complex because we we need to talk about like what is an anti-war film and how do they usually go like it, 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 by my definition, like an anti-war film is a movie uh, which has a message uh, about, like, like a, a message about how war is a bad thing that should be avoided. Which, like a, a surprising amount of movies aren't like that. Like a lot of, uh, for example, Hollywood action films are decidedly not anti-war uh, and very pro-military and stuff like that. Um, th- uh, often, like uh, a-, a lot of what we associate with anti-war films, about either like v- obviously victims in the middle of uh, a war zone, or about soldiers experiencing like you know the horrors of war, uh, you could call it. But there's there's a paradox like at the- at the center of the anti-war movie, especially like the one um, the ones that come uh, and be- become mainstream popular. Because um, um, any like good movie, at least ac- according to conventional wisdom, which is like followed in like especially in Hollywood, uh, you need things like narrative structure. You need characters. You need trials, and you need tribulations, and those c- uh, can all involve like war being hell and the trials like being torturous. But they still n- nevertheless add like this sense of story. To, uh, to to these things, like even the most biting criticisms of uh, how the military works, may still have an element of story which can appeal to people and make people feel, oh, there are these kinds of friendships in the military. There are these kinds of overcoming obstacles 
uh, th there's always this sort of story uh, in it. Well, the most important one, I would argue, heroism. Because yeah. Takahata talked about uh, wartime films and he explained that they tend to be uh, moving and tear jerking and he he disliked that young people according to him develop watching them a sort of inferior inferiority complex seeing people acting so noble and brave more noble and brave than they are and therefore the audience believes according to him that they have nothing to do with this war takahara's purpose with this film was to dispel this mindset because in this film you have a very distinct lack of heroism or absence of heroism or rather when Seta tries to be a big hero he absolutely fails his pride in trying to save uh, Setsuko alone and moving out into the nature and isolating themselves from the world and being the one protector for her fails because we see in him not a noble, heroic little boy, but someone who's scared, who's like always thinking of his father. Hopefully father will punish the enemy. Hopefully father will come back and fix shit for us. And hopefully father will enact revenge on them. Trying his best to protect his sister, but not being able to. Doing mistakes around every corner and really doing the most crucial mistake. Trying to be a hero and going away from society, from community into isolation, in into doing things his own way. And this is the most anti-heroism statement in this movie, I think. That uh, the mistake yeah. he does is trying to be the hero and thus causing the rift between him and community and society. Yeah, I think it's especially potent since um, the bomber planes that we see are all we see of the Americans and the enemy. They're not like these these evil guys that are going to like yeah. grin as they drop bombs on us. They're literally just these impersonal, faceless, uh, faceless planes that fly over and cause this destruction. So that's what I, I think where it's like more of a setting. Like the, oh, the yeah, war yeah, yeah. isn't what's important. It's what exactly. has happened to the civilians. I think like the, the, the thing with uh, Takahata's idea of like anti-war... Uh, being like, like it's, uh, he he says like the main purpose of an anti he implies that the main purpose of an anti-war movie should be to prevent future wars. But I think uh, it's much more about the philosophy and the attitude and and, and the um, and, and the general like ideas it invokes about uh, war and what war even is. Because this this movie yeah. isn't about uh, like. Uh, it isn't anti the enemy invading and bombing. It's not anti uh, people uh, being in those situations. There, it's anti war. The whole idea of like like the, the war as a setting is yeah. such a, is, is such a it's everything that is wrong with the world in this movie and it I is what deeper. kills them uh, yeah in i think the end. i think the way the war functions actually in the movie is it works as a, a multiplier and enhancer for forces that are already present in society yes i i think fundamentally the movie is trying to comment on those attitudes and mentalities that cause the war in the first place yeah what we have is for example scenes where the bombs are falling and someone like from the fire brigade with his mop in in mm -hmm. the air says long live the emperor it's a meaningless gesture it's nothing yeah. but it is like this patriotism the senseless patriotism that you can sense is perpetuating the war the same senseless patriotism or rather senseless um stupid stubborn idea that that Seta puts in his own head saying i need to leave i need to take care i need to isolate myself from the world from society from community instead of interlinking internetworking so this movie is far less about world war ii than it is about the conceitful prideful attitudes that drive a rift between people which is fundamentally at the core of every experience in the war yeah uh, what, what, but the th and the thing is uh, and i agree with you there that pride is a very central theme uh, and and the way it relates to all the characters and to the setting itself and and to the historical context but the 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 reason that I, I think it's kind of secondary to to the anti war thing is that pride should be a f uh, that like wrongfully uh, placed pride and uh, bad decisions shouldn't kill a kid and, and the war the, and the war like put them in a situation where the, where those kinds of decisions were life or death where the communities were weakened in that way. Uh, like th that. That's why I, I don't think it's right to say that like that their decisions were 
the culprit, uh, the reason for the death. The war killed them. That that that's how I, I mean. Feel. F- I I think I agree that it's not just their decisions, but also like every individual fate within this war has these decisions. For example, their aunt like may appear as an unsympathetic character, but we need to think of her as someone who's also suffering all the consequences of the war and also needs to make decisions at every turn and like. It is at the same this movie at the same time puts the blame on the individual dissociating from community as well as on community for failing to provide for the individual. Yeah, I think the aunt is a pretty good character in demonstrating that dichotomy in the way that she comes off as this incredibly like conceited, um, abusive woman who like treats them like shit and then kind of almost forces them out of the house. But also, yeah, she has people to take care of. She has uh, like has to worry about her family. And we even get one scene where, as they're leaving off towards to live uh, out in the air raid shelter, we get this little, like, character animation moment from her where she looks almost, like, regretful and a bit sad that they've left because she did essentially, like, promise to take care of them and they are her responsibility and she kind of forced them away. But it was more of the mindset of, like, oh, if I berate them long enough, they'll learn and they'll he'll go get a job and it'll be better. But instead they just, like, left and she's like, oh... Well, that kind of fucked up. That kind of wasn't what I expected. Her pridefulness doesn't let her redact that, though. There's even one scene of her, like, scraping, like, the dried rice at the bottom of, like, this pan and eating it. So it's like, everyone in this war is suffering. Like, she's suffering. The people who she's trying to feed are suffering. It's just... <laughs> it's just, it's just every, Everyone is in this state of, like, not being able to, like, care for themselves. And so, like, and, like you see at the beginning of the movie, like, this, this idea of community, like... There's this like woman from their town who like tries to help them. She plays with um with um um the sister um Let's go. Let's go and um and like you have the, and like everyone's like trying to help each other at the beginning of the movie. And the farther you go in the movie you see more and more people just like detrust distrusting each other, more and more people like not like um listening to each other. You have like the farmer who beats up um Seta and just like in in activities like that where you show like this collapse of community that is happening around this war. And uh, I think the scraping I was of rice is a very left key out. Oh wait, yeah, I was sorry. I was going to say them um, about the scraping of rice. Uh, that was that made her quite sympathetic for just that one little moment. But uh, there was this part of the short story that was left out. That I wonder if it was intentionally left out by Takahata to make her a bit more sympathetic. Where we learn that she's actually like getting black market food for her. Like she knows this guy who like, fancies her daughter, and so she's basically bargaining with him to get black market food. And so she's not even giving the uh, Sheeta a share of it. And she's like complaining the whole time, even though she's getting more food than everyone else in town by uh, illicit means. And then, then when uh, when when Sita like gives in and like sells their mother's possessions, he doesn't like even get to reap the benefits of. Yeah, yeah she takes that. a cut. I actually want to talk about that because I think that's a really interesting um, image of like the whole idea of um, of clothes in this movie. I think are a really central image. Um, and it's related to the um, whole "quote unquote" pride, which I think is more a, I think I think pride is a wrong word that we used before. I think the word a better word is a kind of masculine like assumption of how men should act, um, more than pride. But um, in this society, but so I think the image of them selling her um her komodos is like the last image that they have of their family of like their like idea of this is what we are as a society and they, they, that's that's i think that's why they ultimately leave is because they've finally given given up their one connection to society which is their clothes um you see seta throughout the movie is wearing a a um a, a, a fire brigade a, a, uniform yeah fire, fire brigade oh. uniform um a, a uniform um i think uh, there's a really good quote from the gold goldberg um um thing um in seta's case as the normalizing gaze is also a spirit's gaze, his social role as a member of the fire brigade, a function we never see him fulfill. As grave was marked as an educational experience for our Japanese school children, who like lies would be wearing school military uniforms, the message would be unmistakable. They are unmistakable. They are asked to see themselves in Seita. So I think this whole idea of like Seita as the supposed failed... Um, expression of this like whole like japanese masculine communal spirit is really important like he should be fighting the fires but he's not he's just sitting around with his yeah. sister um but like it's not like he really can't like he's he's he, he's lost all connections to things and he's living his like role as a masculine protector entirely through quote-unquote protecting his sister but i think that's like that's such a like a so I, I I wouldn't say the the failure really is individual in him but for on a society that would assume that he, a 
kid, a 14-year-old kid, should be bearing the weight of his society. Okay. Like, he could, should be bearing the weight of, like, the collective weight of his, like, of, like the society that, on his shoulders. Like, the aunt keeps saying this, like, why aren't you working? Why, what are you, what are you doing here? Um, and he just keeps invoking the image of his father, like, oh, I'll just wait for my father to come save me. Because it's, like, this whole yeah. idea that, like, there yeah. is, you, you, the masculine authority will come and write itself and save us all. But it, of course, never happens. Yeah, and also in this case, in its on its failed like protector role, I want to mention something that I find very important. When when we we got we talked about the scene of scraping the rice, he also does this, M namely while the fire is dropping, and he he kind I think he pretends to be working for the fire brigade because he also has a mop in this one scene while he's actually stealing. He's going into houses and he's scraping the rice out of the, out of the pots or whatever whatever he can find, you know. And what I find remarkable. Setsuko starves, dies from malnutrition. He of, he doesn't. He has eaten. He is like alive and potent. The original author in an interview has talked about his own experience that he, when he was like stealing food, was eating the food and not giving it directly to his sister or preferring his sister. And his sister died of malnutrition. And that this was like the way he felt guilt and worked through the guilt with a character in the movie who's similarly failing to realize the protector role for the most human and understandable reason. He's there and like stealing the food and doing it the best he can. And it's like, he's eating. Yeah, he, he's taking a few bites first. And this is also ultimately how he cannot like accomplish his mission of protecting his sister. Yeah, and and the whole, at the same time he has the whole there's there is he his father's money is still in the bank. He never goes and retrieves it till the very end, till after it's way too late to save his sister. And I think that's really like indicative of back to the idea that like he has he wants to wait for this um this authority to come save him. Like the money is not his, it's his father's. It's this like space outside of him and he doesn't wanna he doesn't he seems to like half take on the role of like his father, but at the same time he is like of like almost intentionally avoiding that role. Uh, yeah. You mentioned the money, and I believe Takahata specifically references uh, that in one interview where he says that he found that to be uh, like a thing he felt modern children wouldn't properly like understand as part of the message of the film, where he was saying where it's like, money won't solve all your problems. It like He uses it too late, but even then he still probably wouldn't have used it wisely. And it's more the fact that he's become so discordant with society and with the community is really why he died. And yeah. I think um, that's um, also in that stealing and the, during the air raid thing, I think it's br really well illustrated where, yeah, he's he's robbing people of, of his own country who like logically in their like fascistic mindset think that they're all this one United Nation. But he is like, no, I'm going to rob you while you're running away. And there's actually even a little bit where he sees the planes flying up above and he kind of shouts in a hooray because he knows yeah. that when they air raid, he gets to steal. So he's almost egging on the Americans to bomb Japan so that he can live another day and eat. So he's become so disconnected with society. He's basically on the opposite side. Right. I, I, I want to talk uh, more about uh, masculine authority and uh, about uniforms, but, but one thing I wanted to mention while we're uh, talking about this whole uh, uh, Sata being a thief thing is um, like, like we, th this idea that like pride is some, like, like somehow what, uh, what led to, to, to his death, like, like even if it was like it came from the Japanese military society, which affected his father, which, which affected him. If that was the case, then like if if we had like a traditional narrative that was all about the problems of pride, then then w it, when he gives up his pride, uh, when he's caught stealing and he bows down into the dirt to apologize, just like that, that's the least prideful thing you could possibly do, like, like get caught stealing and grovel. He, he gets beat the shit yeah. kicker out of him. Yeah. There's, there's no reward opinion, like, for giving up his The failure of him to measure up to the pre supposed masculine role that he's trying to take. Yeah, it's funny because it's one of the, I think, two moments in the movie where he cries. The one where he finds where he, where, one where, the, the two moments he cries in the movie are the, that moment after he gets beaten up, after he's been proven that his, like, masculine role is a complete failure. And the other time is when his, he, uh, his, his sister basically says, oh, I know your, the, our mother is dead. And he starts crying because he's been, like, he lets go this like because before he says oh, I'm protecting my sister I don't want to tell her about the mother because he's he's playing this role so I think like the times he cries are his the trauma his trauma is his 
ultimate disconnect from this um, hegemonic ideal of how he should act. Yeah, and that, and that's we we get to again his uh, relationship with the father and the mother figure uh, because like the, the, we we don't see them all that much and and like one of the 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 only time like I actually see the father are in uh, in photos or during the taking of a photo um wh- in which he is wearing uh, his uniform and uh, the the family portrait we have the father in the military uniform and the mother in the kimono and, and there we have a great example of identification the exactly. photo taking i mean he always has the photo like he makes sure to get the photo when the air raid is happening in the very beginning of the like when the first air raid is happening on their house he makes sure to grab the photo puts it in his pocket i think even close to his heart or or whatever and he he is basically looking as if he wanted to look into this mirror he wants to be like his father his father is the one who will fix the situation he takes the role of a father for for Setsuko and he fails of course but also during the taking of the photograph and I think this is a very strong scene you see the family standing there Setsuko the mother and the father Seto is nowhere to be seen the photo is about to be taken then he ra- runs in like like a little boy that he is runs in like very excitedly yeah, quickly like stands in attention fixes yeah. himself up his position to look like his father next to his father by the way pushing away his little sister a little bit so this is his figure of identification standing there in uniform both standing there like military people very strict very strong but immediately after the picture is taken he loosens up and disappears again this is a moment that i think highlights perfectly the moment of identification with the father that is central to his character i, I, I love how the image of his father is only communicated through um the picture because it's almost like it's this like intangible this this image that of like oh this is this is how things should be but there's ne- there's never any any even sense of that a physical existence of the father could is even like within like the realm of imagination like it's not it doesn't exist there's no yeah, way we see it's, it's, we it's only see the existed. father three times. Uh, once in the photo, once in the, the the taking of that family photo, and then once when he's looking up at the fireflies, and he he ima- he reimagines the the military um, flotilla parade. And so it's each time it's yeah, it's this intangible goal and ideal. There is no like solidity to the father in the story at all. And getting back to like the idea of uh, of the significance of uniforms, like uniforms are like a really big like japanese symbol like like uh, a- anyone who's seen any like school anime will know about like school uniforms and how uh how, how they're like a big part of the uh, identity of uh, of these l- larger groups and and they're military they're sort uniforms, of it, yeah 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 exactly and military and sailor uniforms are uh, really uh prominent in in that way so that they have this sort of paradoxical um like uh, I- identity these uh sorts of uniforms that at once they symbolize this sort of uh, communal unity which is like something worth fighting for but at the same time they have this um this repressive element and and, and this um propagandist uh, element to them um and and it's uh, like and the dress they ha- they the, the dresses they have and what they do with them is uh, is really important thematically in the film we have of course Sata wearing that brigade uniform uh, early in the film and identifying with the father in the military uniform and we have of course the kimono being sold off uh, later on and uh, and Sata and um and his sister like slowly being stripped of all possessions and identity until like all they have is their desire to not die and they don't even get that his uniform gradually falling apart during the movie is really a stunning image yeah especially because when he when he went after he in the very beginning of the movie his when you he sees you see start the movie with him as a spirit looking at this oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. his dying body and the spirit the um, uniform is completely like is, is completely pristine he like even in death he is like stuck with this role where he's looking at himself, where he's in, in where, where, where he's like, he basically has lost his community, he's lost his like sense of like of place in the community, in his emaciated dying self. But like his spirit is still stuck with it, and you see his spirit go in the duty. Yeah. That's a coat, yeah. So it's like these. That's, that's that's and I think that is a big reason why we never deal with like the greater like you know atomic bomb, the greater like issues of the war as a like entity. It's because I think it's because it never the war never ends for Satan. Yeah, uh, yeah, and uh, I, I think going back to, uh, to to the scene mentioned earlier with the with the fireflies in the cave, uh, where 
we where he reminisces about that uh that flotilla parade uh it, it's a really really good like characterization moment uh, of Sata and and again like adds to this idea that I've been uh, repeating that the war is what killed both of them uh, that 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 in that moment when they have this joy what does he think of he thinks of that moment of grandeur and purpose and victory and he basically um as a reenacts a sort of propaganda for his sister because yeah. that's what that what that's what comforts him uh, and uh, i think uh, yeah uh, goldberg uh, s- uh, says uh, about this scene that um say to transforming the lovely image of the fireflies in the cave into propaganda uh, and uh, i quote here fed by the Id- ideologies that surround him the grand spectacle of military might as well as a personal connection to them by his father whom he emulates and admires later's understanding of the war is not that deep yeah he, do- he really does not understand like really what's happening and and that's part of why the war feels more like a setting thing than like a a part of the story because to him it's just like the everyday world and and he he doesn't get it and we see the movie from his and his sister's perspective actually i I want to i want to talk a a little more in detail on that scene like i think after the nationalistic dream that he has um he basically it's really interesting how it's like basically like has this really vivid image of like of like the, of the of the naval parade and then it fades out and it's just him singing and like you see in the mid background music goes away and him singing becomes seems more pathetic he starts like it seems like it goes from the grand image to like him like sat in the caves then him like he takes like a, a like a fake gun and like shoots around like a little kid and then like it's 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 really it's really fascinating because he's like he's it's turned from this like great like masculine this whole great like idea of like the empire of Japan as this like as this huge nationalistic fascistic like force to like him a little kid in a cave pretending to shoot a gun to try to emulate his father and then after that he tries he basically rolls over his son and sister has fell asleep watching this thing because of course his sister doesn't care this is this, this dream is his dream not hers uh but um he tries he tries to go he rolls over and tries to like hold her basically say okay then my role i'm gonna do my role i'm gonna save her and she like pushes him off she's like no don't get off of me and you see him like look utterly devastated and then the flyer probably start, start dying so I, I just image is just incredible this whole scene i think at communicating this lot death of him of his like ability to emulate his father we'll, we'll definitely get to that uh scene and that symbol uh a, a bit later on but but uh for now i think we should uh we, we should focus on how grave of the fireflies uh relates to the cultural understanding of world war Two within japan because um as is well known and well documented like uh, like after the war uh the ocu- the occupying forces and the uh the native japanese uh, like ha- had to find some way to tell the story of the war while still like moving forward um and the like the the entire like the cultural history of Japan is so tied into th- what happened during and at the end of the war uh, that that it's hard like to actually really explain just how complex the uh, the, the cultural memory of uh, of the, those times are and how and how grave of the five lives like affects that is affected by but there's that. there's a complicated discussion about this very thing and it's the idea of the victim's history exactly and this is also what what in in the sources um has been quite divisive where there were conflicting opinions and we we can see on which side we fall but basically to sum it up that um some japanese film and literature has had the tendency to focus on tell the story of world war ii as a victim's history focusing on the time between 1941 and 1945 and framing the japanese people as victims of a conspiracy plotting between their government and military where the people are basically all victims where the uh, atomic bomb is like treated as something that absolves them of what they did in Pearl Harbor and how they gloss over the Korean colonization and the aggressions towards China that were previously in the war, uh, and so on and so on. So there is the question of focus on on guilt and responsibility of the war contrasted with some 
more revisionist depictions of the world that kind of ignore this complicated and dark side of the history as in favor of a victim's narrative and we kind of should see uh, we kind of should see where where grave of the fireflies falls on this spectrum because in 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 susan napier's text in the book from akira to howl's moving castle there's a chapter comparing grave of the fireflies and um barefoot gen and there she claims that Grave of the Fireflies falls more on the revisionist side, which I've found myself not agreeing with at all. Uh, you can sort of see like the reasoning. Um, she, uh, she describes the movie as uh, as a very passive and uh, and all about like the victimization of these uh, kids. Which I mean, you could see the argument for that. And she compares it to Barefoot Gen, which ha is more active. Uh, with uh, with the characters being given more agency within the story, um, I haven't seen Barefoot again. Um, just to, uh, just to be clear, um, but like it's it's an interesting text. But just like just like uh, Niard, I disagree with uh, with calling this a, a part of this victim uh, history uh, framing because, like like we mentioned earlier, like it's it's such a complex web of causes that uh, killed these kids and it's not just like oh the emperor did a bad and yeah the I, Nazis definitely, allied I haven't and, read oh, no. the um the text you're talking about but uh, i do definitely think that calling it a, a victim story is a bit like reductive because if it is a victim it portrays kind of everyone in the story as a victim but also a perpetrator because we clearly see that it's the society at fault not the navy or the emperor but it is everyone uh, like the aunt who's like too conceited to like let them back in the house and like she wants them to apologize and cheat her for like not apologizing but also we see other people like the police officer who like knows that this guy is stealing just to put to feed his starving sister but then kind of just like doesn't do anything about it or the doctor who tells him yeah your sister's starving so you know eat up even though you're homeless and don't have any food like everyone in the society is implicit in their deaths uh, susan napier uh, says specifically uh that uh, a, a lot of uh quote-unquote anti-war films uh, of post-war japan had uh, quote, little inclination to delve into issues of guilt or responsibility. Um, and she and she says that those sh traits are shared by Grave of the Fireflies and Barefoot Gen, which I disagree with strongly because uh, Grave of the Fireflies is very concerned, uh, I believe actually, with the question of guilt or responsibility, but not necessarily with the answers. It has, oh. yeah, it, it, yeah, yeah. To sum up like Napier's point, I want to like quote a passage, which is that Grave of the Fireflies attempts to construct an elegiac ideology of victimhood and loss that allows for a national identity in which the loss of war gives depth to the Japanese soul. And I agree with on multiple points because we always start like Jap Japan constituting themselves and their national identity after the war as a, a idea of victimhood. This movie cannot be confused for a patriotic movie i don't think it can There's it is no always way. shown how desperate the clinging to patriotism and to father figures and to the the idea of the state and the military is it's always in the moments of hopelessness where it is shown to be futile where it is shown to be irrelevant where if anything senseless patriotism is one of the main things that is being criticized by this movie and on the on the other hand um I don't see how this is constituting a national identity in any case, especially because this movie, if anything, is guilt-ridden and is con attacking any part of like the national identity of the hegemonic male idea of the leader of the family that led to the situation. If anything, the entire movie is guilt, is a movie about guilt. It is about working through guilt, through the semi-autobiographic aspect of the author working through, through the, his own guilt. And... This is remarkable in the sense that in this interview I mentioned earlier, he said that it's a double suicide story. Well, you will realize that in reality, the author survived. His sister died and he survived. That his guilt, his absolving is that he's his fictional stand-in. He's letting him die for his sins, basically. If this doesn't strike you as extremely harshly guilt-ridden, and I don't know. Uh, not to sound like a broken record or anything, but we we should be careful with 
um, reading an author into the work uh, I mean, instead this of the is, other way around. This of is course, his it's words. very relevant. <laughs> of, course his words. It's, of course, his words are relevant and his authorship is relevant. But uh, it, you, you could still like analyze the film and ignore that and that would be perfectly valid but i i think I mean, like yeah. even even within the text uh, you're right that that this this idea of of guilt and responsibility uh, is very important but like i said before like it's not really as interested to answer and point the finger at the emperor or the americans or any individual person that 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 fails something i i think it's uh, it's more a statement of brute fact and that's again it's it again goes back to this uh straightforwardness of the film which we talked about earlier how it's we, we watch as uh as a kid and his little kid sister die during the war and and it and we are the ones uh just t- trying to find like the cause, the meaning of it, but like maybe it's either like too complex to really like point a, a finger any specific way, or it's like so simple uh, that that it's hard to really comprehend. It's it's so simple that the war did it. Like it's it, it that yeah. that's the problem. I I agree with you, and the most indication of this, I think, um, that you're completely right, and I don't even need to take the interviews into this to read it this way, is the framing device, the structure of the movie itself. We see the the we see the entire movie is framed through the eyes of Sata, who's dead, who's a ghost, observing his own like decisions, looking at them, judging them, and inevitably with a sense of guilt, with a sense of. This, uh, these are the moments where I failed, where I um, couldn't keep my promises. And, you know, even if he in, in this situation always thinks it's a correct decision, it turned out it wasn't. And this feeds so beautifully from his own death into the ending scene where, where they both sit and observe the lights of the city, which is where I'm going to quote a little interview bit again, uh, which is where Nosaka talked about um, his own experience after his sister died, which is when the war was already over and the lighting ban, uh, ban in Japan was lifted. So the, the there was a ban on like using electricity for electric lighting. So the cities were dark. When his sister died, he he like buried her and then climbed like, up a hill and looked over the city and then the light turned back on. And he felt like he was leaving this world of darkness that had previously enveloped him behind him while moving forward into the light, but he didn't feel comfortable in the light, instead just feeling like the darkness has never ne- never left him, like that he still carried the darkness of his guilt where he left his sister with him. And I think the final scene is thus like in, in like a like a strong symbolic statement of this guilt of them both watching over the lights of the city while they are sitting in the darkness of of just surrounded by the fireflies. Alright. I think that scene, that final shot of them looking over the city is particularly potent because I always read it as um modern japan that they're looking over the rebuilt uh big electric city and it's like the the incredibly strong feeling of guilt because it's like these ghosts of the past of these people that have died in our society because our society neglected them they're still watching over us they're still like here as a pervasive guilt so there's no like absolving any kind of the world war Two mistakes it's like always there and it's always gonna be there and we have to kind of like Le- learn about it and like learn to live with it as opposed to any kind of absolution and yeah, there's there's definitely like a theme there of of haunting uh that goes through the entire film like the way the the mother uh, and her possessions uh like still binds her to them in a way uh, in a spiritual sense and the the, the way the father is still f- feels present even though we don't know he, if he's dead or not and of course the framing device with uh Sata's ghost looking over the whole thing and finally, like their ghosts looking over, like all of Japan in a way, uh, symbolically, and uh, and I think it's a theme that like sort of goes again uh, with Takahara, especially in the next movie. He uses like the the sort of looking back, this uh, retrospect, to um, to add to his stories, to change their their meanings. Uh, like e- even in his uh, final film, that there's like this element. Of the telling of uh, of a tale that uh, that that sort of uh, elevates uh, the story. 
Um, but w- uh, what I find most interesting about this isn't like the theme of haunting. It's the way the structure uh, becomes so important to this film. Like we've talked about again, again, how like s- uh, kind of straightforward uh, the the movie is. Uh, I think that's because like the complexity of this movie isn't necessarily in the text itself, but it's in. Um, of course, the cultural um, context of the film and in the structure of the film, because we start the movie with Sater dying and his spirit lo- uh, a- a- again uh, saying, "This date is the day I died." And now you're going to watch l- like the events that uh, that got to that point, and like like. S- uh, declaring the ending of the film out loud at the beginning is uh, a technique as old as like Greek tragedies. Like, uh, the Greek choir comes out and and says, "This is going to end terribly for uh, Oedipus. Are you ready?" And th- then uh, you watch it. Um, but I think this like, particularly it's- draws upon an older f- form of Japanese storytelling, the double suicide stories. I've forgotten the years, but I've read about this. Um, basically, the double suicide stories f- began with the announcement of the ultimate fate of the couple that were that was being talked about, similar to Romeo and Juliet, but just a very uniquely Japanese style and sensibility that one author was very prolific about, and I forgot his name, and I feel really bad about that. But yeah, there, there were a lot of influential like stories and and uh, of this. Caliber, caliber was this kind Monze of frame Mon device. Chikamatsu. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, and and this um, exactly, and this uh, structural decision just affects a work in in such a deep way. Like knowing from the very start that this kid is going to die, and by extension, like we we sort of all the all throughout the film assume or already know because we've heard about the film that Setsuko will die as well. Um, it just it colors the entire film. Uh, in such a different way because like there's no m- there are moments where the characters experience a bit of hope but there's no second where we the audience get to experience that hope uh, we are in a way distanced from them but also we have like a b- a bigger understanding of what their story like truly means the the significance and insignificance of uh, the story that's being told to us yeah, we're not given any illusions that perhaps they make it through it. Perhaps it turns out for the better uh, as we're watching the film. Um, yeah, exactly, and the film is filled with this, uh, this, this anti-narrative sentiment. This uh, th- that w- whenever you uh, expect, oh, here's the conflict, and now, uh, like between the kids and their aunt, for ex- for example. Uh, now we get to see how they get out of it. But no, we just get to see the next step towards their death, the next step in this downward spiral. And and that that's all, because we're told from the very start this is a story about watching these kids die. And at the end, that's exactly what it is. Yeah, there's there's a great quote from the Emma Bugelberg, I think is um is um topical. Um she says, At the beginning of the film, Sata's dying thought is what day is it? But his spirit knows because he tells the viewer. The fact that he knows the date suggests that this day is a this is a day that he will not easily cast aside, raking it even more, um, above more significant dates of the war, such as the atomic bombings at Nagasaki and Hiroshima, and the Emperor's surrender. At the end of the film, Seito holds Setsuko's sleeping figure, his face stoically looking at the, uh, uh, um, looking. While we may focus on um, Setsuko's great suffering throughout the film, we are also asked to examine Seito's failure to protect her. His choices reflect society at large. The spirits of Seito and Setsuko from Grave of the Fireflies, the film. Um, the film begins and ends with Seta's deaths and the circularity to suggest that this is a cycle we he can't escape even in death. Um, I'm I sure that's, that's a cycle, but uh, but it, it, no, it, a- it, I think it I think it I think it really is a cycle. I think we be to- I think that's a really important thing. That's why at the very end the image is not of Tokyo lighting up after the war. The, the image is of or not Tokyo, whatever the city is, but it's rather of the city of modern Japan. Like I I I think it's really important to like understand the framing of this from its like historical perspective of when the movie was made. Because the movie was made at a time when Japan has almost like forgotten the war. Like Takahata was making this film as a almost didactic explanation of, oh, this is this is what we're missing now. This is what we 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 we've tried. To, we've we 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 see ourselves as escaping in this like very like you know this is when Japan was at its like economically like most thriving time when this movie comes out. And I think that's that's really interesting in that regard that you have 
the dead spirits always watching. Like there, he when he when he dies, his his um uniform is restored because the um the masculine authority has been restored onto him. He's been he's forced to basically bear this weight for like all eternity, watching the city. Um, no, I, yeah. I disagree. I think it's a I I think it's a thing with what he himself like thinks of himself. Like like that that's how he wishes to to see himself. It's not like there's some sort of cosmic like like placing a burden on this ghost to watch over japan i th- uh, i i think the the re- restoration of the uniform when he when he uh, becomes a spirit is more about his self identity and and what was lost when he oh. died yeah here's something i think sunny has pointed something interesting which like provide maybe provides more dimensions to this w- what if like in a sense of like collective identification of cultural like hindsight the figures of the almost martyric figures who died in the war become retroactively idealized and put into these positions of uniform of uniforms and and hegemonic roles i'm this is quite a conflicting idea because i don't know thunny what do you think about this yeah i i think essentially this movie is trying to talk about the death of this this basically this basically basically this movie's trying to get rid of this idea of like basically romanticizing the past. See, it's completely like taking away any kind of idea. Oh, look at look at these look at these victims. Look at these like suffering people. No, these people were the people who were these people made the war. These people. This is, I think this is a very this movie condemns these people and condemns modern Japan as a reflection as these people who um, basically are trying to um, how do I say this? Basically. Um, they're trying to basically. I think what 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 was trying to be said by this movie in an interesting regard is this um, attempt to show how this masculine authority, while it it did die in the war and it was never accessible, it never was accessible, it never was real and as a thing, it only was a basically a, yeah, a ghost death of a killed, yeah, in a way, um, yeah, but um, ghost that haunted everyone again, yeah. the ghosts, yeah, um, but. And there's this um in the Nap- Nap- Napier article who talks she talks about how um um, um fem- the, the, there's this big feminization that happens in Japanese culture after the war and this whole idea of like you know approaching like the world as like that of like the the, the, the cute and like the like the cute culture and this, this that kind of comes along with the capitalism but I, I think that's almost like an avoiding of the fact that Japan never left that masculinized like perspective. And I think Takahata is like trying to criticize modern um, expressions of like the basically the, the masculine like spirit that they've canonized in the war, and that is what the ghost watching over modern Japan is. So, so I I know that Takahata is uh ha- is and has been like very critical of um, modern Japan, just like uh, Miyazaki. But I'm not sure like that I read as much. Uh, t- contemporary criticism, uh, like at, at, of course, contemporary at the time, um, in in the text itself. Um, e- e- even though, like, I agree that of, that obviously, like the, f- uh, the that final shot where they overlook uh, a more modern Japan lighting up does definitely have some significance to uh, to the uh, to the present day. I um, think Sandy is onto something here with a, psych- a cyclical nature, cyclical nature of it, because Takahata has expressed in like uh, rejecting like um, he he's of course a staunch supporter of Article Nine of the Japanese Constitution, which is the article after World War Two that deemed that uh, Japan should only have a self-defensive military and never a- aggressively engage in war again. Which Shinzo Abe tried to kind of fiddle around with and work around with like later after the movie, of course, but. Um, in, in response to this event where Shinzo Abe tried to like uh, reinterpret the the Article 9, Takahara commented that he feels despair and anxiety whenever the youth are told to fall in line. A reminder for him that the country at its core has not changed. So for him, there exists this mindset that the country hasn't hasn't completely changed. That this pervasive pervasive idea of the hegemonic male uh, power figure, this this power fantasy, this prideness and falling in line, this uniformity culture, all still exists. And I think we're onto something here when Sandy says that this spirit, this uniformed spirit, represents this in some capacity, this return of this idea. Well, uh, I think there's it's much more final 
um, I, I, I think uh, maybe it's just the word cyclical that, that I disagree with because I think there's definitely something to it that these uh, these kids they died in the war uh, they died because of the war and they they haunt Japan. That's um, that, that that's that's, def that's definitely true. But there's still this the sense that this these lives and these like these the thoughts these kids had disappeared with them and uh and linger and uh and haunt japan i don't think that that means that there's any sort of cycle going on where that mentality returns in, in any way i think it's more of um a reminder and a, again a haunting which isn't exactly like a cycle I, I disagree with the finality of that because, as I as, I, as I've noted before, like there's no there's no um, there's no looking sort of, at sort of finality. There's still like the that afterlife thing, that ghost thing, that haunting that but, lingers. But like there's there's I don't think there's ever an end to the war in a way in this 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 in this film. I think the film presents the war as this almost continuous like um um idea. Because it never, the, the, I think the war is not is disconnected from the idea of the actual Pacific War between America and and um, and Japan, and has changed to rather a war of um, what I say, it's a war of Japan, Japanese of the like spirit. Um, yeah, war of the spirit, a, a Japanese war against its own like community. It's basically a, a war of Japan consuming itself, and that war goes on forever. And I think that's that's why there's no strict end. That's why he doesn't know when the war ends. That's why there's no looking at the atomic bombs. That's why there's no looking at the emperor's surrender or the death of the um, cult of the emperor. Like this stuff, are well, and, and why they die after the war has already ended because like yeah. the consequences of the war don't end like when they surrender. Exactly. I, I can and definitely I, I can definitely see that. I just think that um, that, that the movie's uh, message and the, the the movie's like structure is much more like again straightforward than that even though like i can i can definitely see like how you could read that into it but i think it's something we add to it instead of something that we really extract from the film itself Perhaps. that's just my opinion um still talking about the whole idea of um this kind of going back to what we talked about um in like the masculine authority we never we never mentioned the whole idea of like the feminine as the feminine as just opposed against the masculine because it, there's an interesting image um, in the very end of the movie of um, of basically there's a vignette of um, of a bunch of images of um, Setsuko um, basically performing a bunch of activities around the the um, yeah, their, playing the, house. The, the, yeah playing house playing house but it's, it's, it's interesting because what, what, what the images are because they start off with her on a on, on a basically playing she's on she's on she's on a um, she's, on, she's on a swing and then they switch to her doing more um, feminine quote unquote feminine motherly like activities she's like sweeping up the house she's um she sews this um this um she's, she's sewing something she cuts herself she's sewing it so it's like you know bleeding it's like you know probably a, it's a sort of reference to a mass like menstruation um and then finally the you have her in a basically she's wearing her looks like her brother's boots she has a, a basically a, like a walk on her head and she's saluting and i, and I think this like and, and then after that she goes in the and then the final images of her playing rock paper scissors with herself in the water and I think all these images show this kind of level of um, performativity of like all these different roles because she plays through all the roles. She plays the masculine role of um, saluting and like wearing the wearing a faux uniform. She plays the feminine role of um, of um, sewing and cleaning, and she plays the ch child's role of um, playing um, playing like playing in the swing and playing rock paper scissors. And I and this is I, and I think this is this is really important to the whole um sh like spiritual structure um structural nature of the movie because this happens like very near the end after like you have like the um people across the the um the water in their like kind of big mansion house saying oh look nothing changed and then like and it um and then the um the camera pans across and you see this girl the spirit of this girl performing these um these all these hegemonic activities of how one could act in society and it's like and it's like reductive but like purposely so into these these roles um, I'm uh, not sure exactly not, where not, this. Well, I, I, think, I, I think I see where you're going with like yeah. this. Uh, this comment that nothing changed. Well, no, in a way, yes, but in a way, everything changed. Like the very identity of Japan and the identities available to the Japanese changed. Uh, I, I think is what you're getting at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So you know what the elephant in the room is that we didn't fully address yet and didn't really talk about a lot at all? The title. This is really strange. Yes, the fucking title. <laughs> Grave of the Fireflies, Hotaru no Haka. Uh, Japanese, the uh, title is written in a different kanji than what you would usually use for Firefly, which is in extremely interesting to me. Because um, the kanji they use for Hotaru, Firefly, instead of like the, the insect itself, it is the kanji for fire. So it translates to fire dropping from the sky in a, in a, in a, in a certain reading. Oh, which so is, it's so it's both means like fireflies and also like the, the fire bombs, bombs. Yeah, the fire bombs. So the firefly functions at the same time as a symbol of of the the insect that is shining and is short lived, like the Japanese hope, like the children that faded out and died so quickly. Why must fireflies die so quickly? As uh, Setsuko says, but also the bombs, the thing that ultimately brought the despair, which is also the <coughs> uh, sorry, the Japanese movie poster. If you look carefully and like maybe brighten it a bit, you can see that behind like uh, Setsuko and Seta playing with uh, in the field with the fireflies, there's actually a bomber airplane dark looming over the fireflies, so that the fireflies can be read uh, also as dropping bombs in the poster itself. Yeah, yeah. they uh, clearly did this with the coloring as well, because whenever we see uh, the ghost versions of them, they're lit by this like s s cloud of fireflies that follows them around. But it's always this exact uh, orange color that is the exact same used for all the bombs and uh, burning imagery in the film also. And there's even a shot where it's the bombs sprinkling over the horizon and it's the exact same kind of like orange shading that gives you the notions of fire as opposed to the more luminescent color fireflies actually are. It, it, get back, it gets back to this uh, idea that I keep coming back to, which is like how straightforward it is while also have like having like this complexity beneath it. Like uh, the the fireflies, like we have this scene uh, where uh, where Setsuko is really excited about these luminous uh, insects. So Seta decides, oh, let's let's get a whole bucket of them in here, and they and they fill the cave they live in with fireflies, and it's a beautiful moment, and it makes them like happy for a bit. And then it then, turns into propaganda. And it turns into propaganda, but we, we, we've already dealt with that. And uh, then they die. And then I just wanted to highlight, die. this is the motion of the symbol of the firefly, right? The hope, they can see each other, they can like feel glad and have light helping them out in their loneliness. Exactly. Then it turns into propaganda, this national spirit that is like, the national hope of Japanese people could be the firefly, like the glowing, the light. But then it is transformed into propaganda, and then it well, dies. Well, it, it, it could it be drops a, to like the ground. At the, but I, th I think at the, in the very core of the symbol, it's so simple. Beautiful things are fragile and fleeting. Like the, the only permanent the thing is death. That's like the theme of all Japanese literature. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's, that's the whole but, thing. But, <laughs> but also, this is what I want to say. It's not just Mono no Avaro, because the danger that is inherent to this beautiful thing, as in how it is used, is, is made apparent by yeah, turning the firefly into propaganda and then it dies. The, and this is, this is also what we can see in Seta and Setsuko. I talked about this already. They bury the fireflies because they killed them. Uh, not, not really they killed them, but they died at their hands. They are yeah. to blame. They trapped the firefly into their net for their own gain and then they were dead. The grave of the firefly when they buried them is, is the title giving thing is this symbol, this complex development from beautiful thing instrumentalized for for selfish purposes and then it falls apart in a sense uh even and more sad i don't know if it's if we see it in the film but i also distinctly remember the short story he says that when he like puts her in that little wicker coffin he also um puts a bunch of dead fireflies in there with her to like light her way uh, her soul as she dies so like they'll be with her as they burn also and of course, like, the symbolism now I'm getting of all that depressed hope dying again. as well. Yeah, it's quite a quite a struggling image. Yeah, I've Maybe they really forgot about that, that reason. The image where they buried the fireflies also was interesting because when they're th when they're pouring the fireflies into the grave, um, there's this match cut of their mother being poured into a mass grave. Yeah, and that's the scene where we reveal that she knows she's been dead the whole time. It's it's really straightforward, like the metaphor in that way, uh, because there's also exactly that element of the mass grave, because like there are so many of them, the, these fireflies, they uh, they become like an indistinct mass, and like no individual firefly really like gets to be its own thing, and that's also part of this movie. Um, there's um, 
this uh, the YouTuber Big Joel, uh, who I highly recommend everyone subscribes to, has a video about this uh, this film where he points out some some of the narrative threads, the themes, the contradictory themes, and one of the things he says is like at once uh, the movie wants us to understand how important the story of Seta and Setsuko is, but at the same time their story is deeply incidental. Uh, it's th- they they could be anyone. Uh, we see so many faceless corpses and uh, f- and and people who are dying or dead that we need to look away from because we we can't tell all those stories. And mm-hmm. and a- again, like the fireflies are such a good metaphor because they're so straightforward in that way. They're, it's so direct, like the 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 meaninglessness of the deaths and the um, and the amounts of them uh, as well just, just, a little, just a little image that like relates to that and near the very beginning of the movie there's this um there's um S- um Seta is, is is um is, is basically dying and there's garbage men looking through his stuff and then the garbage man looks up and then there's another like boy on the other side of the pillar who's dying which we hadn't seen until this very moment he's like oh another one yeah, the, exactly. I remember that specifically. And the, 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 just the casualness one. to all this death. Like, we even get some, like, people passing him by, and it's like, oh, look at these dying um, people. They're making the place look bad before the Americans get here. Like, the the casualness to, like, this mass death just, like, cannot be understated. Uh, when we get back to this unceremoniousness uh, of it all, uh, this this way that it hangs over the whole film, and, it, and it's the reason why it's... Uh, the, the structural decision to tell us up front what that, that these kids are going to die um, the, the, we, we get to also like have the, this contradictory feeling where at once we um, we, we follow these kids and we uh, we wish them the best but we also understand like deep down and like and factually, that they are doomed, that that they are going to die, and that's that doesn't make their deaths any less devastating. In fact, I I think it makes them more so because, like, I I don't think there's any movie that I've seen that's as devastating as this. So, the the decision to to tell us up front, like, it adds to this feeling of despair and hopelessness. And and once we really get to that feeling that we've been dreading the whole time, it just hits like a like a ton of bricks. So a scene I want to tap into in regards to the symbol of the fireflies being buried, the grave of the fireflies, is interestingly enough how uh, Setsuko herself makes the parallel. After she's buried the fireflies, she's saying, Mom is buried in a similar grave. And this is also when Sata breaks down and realizes that she knew all along. But also, like, he explains to her, and I think this is a lie, but he explains to her that mom is buried under a giant comfort tree. Interesting enough, a giant comfort tree is also a symbol in Totoro. And this really makes us think that these movies in a double screening, which when watched back to back, uh, have an interesting, like, parallel. Both deal with child protagonists who retreat to their imagination to better cope with the harshness of the world, like by building the home in the in the little den in the caves, versus like the imagination of the Totoros in the forest. And while Satsuki and Mei in Totoro are playing like with forest spirits, like to kind of deal with the idea of their mom's mortality, who is not there, and so on. Also, absent parents is a common thread between both of the films. While in Grave of the Fireflies, Seta and Satsuko look after each other and desperately cling to this innocent idea of childhood like childhood den building is also a thing that is happening like right kids build like their own tree houses or little like dens made out of blankets and so on and the cave in my opinion is very reminiscent of this uh, while like their optimism exists and they flee into this fantasy world but it's slowly being leached away by the outcomes so the two movies of course have entirely different outcomes of that but both feature and this is quote unquote uh adventures of of two siblings who like certainly deal and address topics of death in like a roundabout or more direct way depending on the movie you know and i think this ties into an idea i started discussing in totoro but we'll discuss here again, uh, again that totoro deals with an alternate history where nature is mystical and nurturing and uh and gives solace and 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 and, and 
care and imagination and fantasy. Where the while, community is good and every, yes. everything is fine and nice. The and alternate history as if the, the war didn't happen like it did, didn't like tear the community apart. Or on Grave of the Fireflies, the war did happen. Nature is cold and unnurturing. It is, they try in their fantasy to create a nature which is being, as, a, as a home, a hidey hole from the world for them, but they can't. So there's this dichotomy between the two movies, the different approaches to nature and community, which I think is really interesting because it also highlights something that is kind of integral to both Takahara's and Miyazaki's approaches to depicting nature in general. Yeah, and, and, uh, and, and it also ties back to this idea, um, th th this like sort of cultural and philosophical idea that after the horrors of World War II, uh, Japan needed to at once... Uh, repress and remember at the same time. Um, oh yeah. So so so, so in a way, um, you could argue that Totoro is this sort of uh, repression, or alternatively, this a, a coping of sorts, uh, th this soothing, this uh, yashike, this healing. And here we have the direct confrontation and memory uh, of uh, that that time as it is. The failure was. of the fantasy to repress the trauma of war, I want exactly, to say. Exactly, yeah. Well, and I love that image because like, they, they do try to make it fantasy. They, they go out, they leave society, they go into this like, pseudo-nature um, area where they're in, a, they're in a bomb shelter, and they're, but it's like, it's like they, make, they make a home. The, the, um, yeah. the, a the a sister, shelter, shelter, very <laughs> important word there. Yeah. <laughs> and the, uh, the, sister, the sister names all the locations. This is going to be the kitchen. This is going to be the bedroom. And where's the bath? <laughs> it's, 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 it's kind of funny. The playing house scene. again. Um, yeah, with the, the, whole in, play, in the, the play. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's like this whole idea of um of like making a space that's like that's like sacred and safe, but like of course it fails. Okay. So and I think a scene and also this is a moment that was highlighted by Big Joel in the video re you recommended, which I found interesting. The moment we realize that the two of them are just playing a fantasy is when the other kids come. Like, three other kids appear, look at the stuff, they like, who, who's eating this stuff? Dried frogs? Ugh. These kids highlight our role in the movie as spectators witnessing this fantasy. They serve to break us out out of accepting the movie reality as that what it is, and we are forced to see what they're actually doing there. That they're actually make, doing make-believe there, that they're actually pretending to be alive and well and doing good. But they aren't. They are complete outcasts. These kids come and like really point out how, like when both of them eat, when Seta and Setsuko eat, they always, mmm, delicious, mmm, that's good. And those kids come there, open the, the pot and say, ugh, and I thought my food was shitty. We are made, we are highlighted how hard these kids are repressing. And the movie is telling us, you are an audience, this scene has only this one purpose of ripping us out of that moment of identification with the characters and the fantasy and revealing to us the falseness of the fantasy. Uh, and and like I think that's that gets to something like I I think what all these discussions like point to is uh, that, like something I I think might be at the core of uh, Grave of the Fireflies is this these it's full of these contradictions like we have uh, the distance of viewership and the intimacy of watching a loved one die. We have uh, the pridefulness of the characters and the selflessness of wanting deeply to to care for this kid. Um, we we have ha the uh, importance, the feature length film importance of uh, of the, this story and the incidentality of the, the story. How yeah, how incidental it is, um, and 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 on it goes with uh, the lost uh, stability of the traditional household and the uh, oppressiveness and fascism of the uniforms that symbolize those kinds of households um and 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 it all it all revolves around the inherent like paradox of of war the, the idea that war is ever like good for anything if it results in like the death of even one Setsuko, who, like in the state of animation, comes to represent uh, the very idea of children dying from starvation, and like even at the very end, as a ghost, the uh, the Japan's past haunting it 
even to this day. Beautiful ending words. Thank you. Uh, all right, then. This was it. Uh, the Grave of the Nausea cast. Look forward to the next cast when we will be returning to Miyazaki with Kiki's Delivery Service. And until then, if you want to support us and help us upgrade our microphones to finally sound decent, uh, you can pledge us a Please. few bucks on Patreon. That is patreon.com slash Nausicast with double A. But also, drumroll please, very new, we have now created the Discord server. And if you want to reach out to us and talk to us and maybe about Ghibli movies, but also about other topics, other art, video games, philosophy, anime in general, and so on. Uh, the Discord server is available for you and will be linked in the description. And for those who are not listening to the version on YouTube, go to YouTube in the description. There's the invite link. You can join us. We're looking forward to talking to you. So, now that I shield enough of our stuff, I wish you a pleasant day and goodbye. Bye. 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 Good life. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be sad. Sad.